This is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Ghanem. And this is Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we are on the precipice of war in the Arab world and Middle East as we speak. Just in the last week or so, we've seen um, provocations from the Israeli military that have been deeply disturbing. They've sent sorties and bombed Iraq. They've had incursions into Syria, and they're actively engaged with drone and military action in Lebanon. This is a direct provocation. I believe this is a invitation and provocation for the Israeli military mm -hmm. to start war and uh, starting war with Iran with using uh, Lebanon, Syria, and uh, Iraq as proxies, Jamal. I am very, very concerned. Well, the, the thing, Jess, of course, Israel has not uh, taken responsibility uh, for most of these, you know, and as, as, uh, uh, as you've said correctly, a series of airstrikes in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, basically, they all happened. You know, this is escalating things to into a wider conflict, and they all happened, by the way, since Saturday. Since Saturday, so right? It's all one after the other, which Israel, of course, claims that it has uh, thwarted an Im imminent Iranian attack by striking an elite wing of Iran's revolutionary. Uh, Gardner uh, in Gardner Damascus right you know so that's this is their claim at least they've taken responsibility for one for one of the three because they have not uh, taken responsibility for for example for the Iraq which is actually more serious it's much more serious because Iraq does not share a border right so this is something like going out of their way it's reminiscent of the attack on Iraq's nuclear reactors in 1981 in, in the in exactly in the in the 80s and so and and think about it also at, at this point at least Iraq is supposed to be an ally to the United States we're not talking about Saddam Hussein and they're violating its airspace flying over other countries basically to attack Iraq but then going back, and, and um, a statement was issued today, actually by the Israeli military, saying that they are giving a warning that Iran is spreading too close into the Israeli border, and therefore, and, and which, by the way, only the United States and Israel, they've claimed this preemptive strikes. Like they, they think that they are the only powers in the world that they that have can the do right. This, right. Yeah, so, so under the preemptive. And so what happened, of course, right? So Hezbollah, which because Lebanon, even though there was a soft response uh, from, uh, uh, from the Lebanese government, I would say, but Hezbollah and Hassan Nasrallah made it clear that there will be a retaliation. And so Hezbollah, Nasrallah said, okay, you're violating Lebanon's airspace and we're going to answer. Right. I mean, under what, you know, like, what do you, you know, how can you just like do that, right? And so uh, there has been picture, there were some pictures circulated all over the internet showing that some of the sites, in fact, one of the reporters for this uh, television channel called Al Mayadeen went over the border into Israel. There were no, they, they had some jeeps and they were abandoned and they had dummies in oh, dolls, really? basically dolls. I'm serious. That's crazy. So there, are, so there have been, you know, reports and jokes and tweets about it that they are scared because Hassan Nasrallah. And they've taken very seriously, he's put Israel on high alert, right, across the border after this. And But uh, Jamal, would it be fair to say that Hassan Nasrallah doesn't bluff? No, he doesn't bluff. So, so, so basically, if Hassan Nasrallah puts the Israelis on notice, they are going to take him seriously. Can we also remind our listeners that the only military power that has been able to vanquish Israel from the southern, southern part of Lebanon has been Hassan Nasrallah. 
Well, Hezbollah. Well, Hezbollah, under his leadership, have been the only military force that have been able to vanquish Israel from the south of Lebanon. So Israel went on high alert uh, after also the deputy leader, Hezbollah's deputy leader, said that his forces would launch a surprise retaliatory strike against Israel because of Israel is attempting to attack it. Of course, they've had the two drones on Sunday, the two drone attacks, and and then that kind of put the whole Israeli leadership into a panic. Netanyahu went on the air yesterday warning, not Hezbollah per se, he was warning Lebanon right. and Syria and other Arab countries because he knows that he was not going to have any effect on Hassan Nasrallah. If they have a plan, they're going to execute their plan. Right. So, so in order to kind of like send a strong message, because this is how, you know, he, uh, basically Israel normally what it does, and this is what it did in 2016, it retaliated against civilian right. uh, population. It, 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 it retaliated against Lebanese infrastructure destroying Bridges, remember? Bridges, highways, highways, major buildings that were actually owned by Saad al-Hariri in right. Beirut. Well, so, also, so also electrical power. Electro so they were sending a strong, like, okay, if you don't control Hezbollah, if you don't control Hassan Nasrallah, even though they are the ones who has, They're the have, have re, re, uh, uh, violated Lebanon's airspace and they violated almost on a daily basis, basis right. sending drones, sending planes and wherever. And then with just this one time, they kind of like, they lost two drones, right? They lost two drones. And Hassan Nasrallah said, okay, we're not going to play again. We're not going to play with you. You're going to do this. We're coming after you. Are you are forewarned and we're coming after you. Now, I have a question. Which Arab leader has the ability to kind of put the entire Israeli occupation army um, on alert, well, the, make them withdraw from the border on high alert, make them withdraw. Well, Jamal, the answer... Just to, with one sentence. Well, well, Jamal, the answer to your question is actually very easy. Because if you look at the history of uh, Israeli military incursions, there's a, and I said this before, there's only been one military force, and that's under the direction of Hassan Nasrallah, uh, commanding the, the Hezbollah military apparatus has been the only military that has been able to uh, defeat the Israeli army, the Israeli military in the south of Lebanon and get them to leave. They're the only ones. I, I, I'm, Benjamin Netanyahu better realize, Jamal, that Hassan Nasrallah does not bluff. No, he does not bluff. And Hassan And Nas actually that he knows that. Benjamin Netanyahu knows this. But again, but see, Benjamin Netanyahu, if you look at his history, the elections are around the corner. Well, we're going to get. Same, it's we're going to get. But we're going to get to the why in a chapter minute. Chapter in that right. book, trying to rally the Israelis behind right. him, right? So they'll elect him, right? Again right. and again. I mean, he's the longest-serving right. prime minister of Israel, and the only reason he could, he can get people behind him is through fear. Yeah, we're gonna. We're actually gonna. That's a good point, Jamal. We're actually gonna have a long discussion about the context. The reasons, the why, the what, the where, the global political context, because although we're talking about this in a, in, in a more isolated fashion between, you know, basically talking about Hezbollah and the Israeli military, there's a larger context that is going on right now, which we're going to fill in the details. Um, let's take it at the regional level first, okay? Regionally, what is going on is that the Israelis have been making footsie and ma with uh, UAE, with the Gulf countries, with MBS and Saudi Arabia, to put pressure on their, what they're saying is their global threat, which is Iran. Mm -hmm. So in the larger picture, we know that some of this has to do with the Israeli election, and the other picture has to do with trying to de destabilize Iran, and I think in some ways provoke Iran into a war. I think that's probably what they're trying to do. The stars are aligning themselves because you have the Gulf countries, mostly UAE 
and Saudi Arabia who also perceive Iran as a threat. Mm -hmm. So you have this global context right now in the Gulf, in the Middle East, of the Americans, the Israelis, the Saudis, and UAE on one side against Iran, who has been positioning itself with Russia more recently in some very strong ways, and ironically with Turkey. Mm -hmm. So you see the political... You're missing, you're missing one, one thing. Let me get to that and just let okay. me finish this. All so right, we'll get to these other, these other contexts. So because of the election, because of these other things that are going on, I believe that Benjamin Netanyahu has miscalculated as usual, but this is a direct attempt to create this inflamed, destabilized situation before his election, but also an attempt to draw Iran into another war and to strengthen the relationships with the Gulf countries. Mm -hmm. That's part of the larger political context. But I know I forgot something. Well, I just was going to add to this equation because you're, you're correct about connecting the dots. So we have this whole thing about his elections because Benjamin Netanyahu, when he starts talking tough or when he bombs Gaza, which, by the way, Bombing Hezbollah is not bombing Gaza. No, bombing civilians is not bombing so the military. Right. He knows that he's going to scare off the Israeli population. He's going to tell them now, look at the rockets raining at you, because Hezbollah has to retaliate, right? And, and then they're going to vote for him, because whenever the Israeli public is uh, basically, f f basically feeling threatened, right. they vote Likud. They Always. don't vote for any other party. Right. So that's number one. Then the number two thing, Benjamin Netanyahu has he's tried every single trick in the book to egg the United States to do his dirty bidding, starting from Obama. If you recall, the right. times he used to come to the United Nations with his show and tell uh, poster telling them that Iran is about like five minutes away from acquiring nuclear weapons right. and all these graphs and then saying that they stole some secrets, uh, you know, about uh, Iran's nuclear program. Obama did not buy this. And the negotiations continued. And of course, this is his perfect now, his perfect opportunity, right? This is his perfect op opportunity with Donald Trump. Right. Even though, like Donald Trump, by the way, you know, I, and, and, and in my opinion, the reason he has not done something really crazy besides saying, OK, we're not going to recognize our agreement with Iran. We're going to throw this, uh, you know, off the table. I think the military, the U.S. military, the CIA and the security agencies, they're saying, hey, wait a minute, this is not a wise thing to do. We're not going to do Israel's dirty work. I mean, he has tried, like I said, every single trick in the book. Just two days ago, if you look at, at if you go and read the Israeli media, especially, I'm not, I don't say don't, everybody reads Haaretz, which is the liberal media, and they kind of know, uh, you know, Netanyahu's tricks. Read it out, Ahranot, read their, uh, the, uh, basically. The Fox News equivalent. The Fox News equivalent, yeah. and see what they've been writing about Iran's nuclear program. See that just today they said that Iran now has been testing um, missiles uh, pin that can pinpoint targets, as if Israel doesn't have these missiles. Like, God forbid that another country would acquire technology. So they're putting all these things out there that, come on, let's strike Iran. But they're not going to strike Iran. They know that they have a strong retaliatory power behind it. So they, go, they are going to pick on certain targets. Go into, for example, Iraq, which they are denying or they're not acknowledging, but like what? Bombs and uh, drones just rain from the air. They come out of nowhere into Iraq, right? And right. attack. Uh, well, it's pretty clear that Israel so did bomb Iraq. So we know that Israel is behind this. They tried something else in Lebanon. They failed. Right. They failed. Right. And now, Hassan Nasrallah said, enough is enough. You're going to do, uh, do this again. We have the capability to strike. He always, what he says, what I like actually in Arabic, he says, we have the capability to strike Haifa and what's beyond Haifa. <laughs> he doesn't even say the targets because Haifa is pretty deep. And then he says, what's beyond Haifa? That, in other words, we have long range missiles. So the other thing I wanted to connect with all of this, trying to help Benjamin Netanyahu, because he's trying to pick a battle, right? Is now, uh, just yesterday, right? 
Greenblatt, Jason Greenblatt, he said that they that the United States will not release the long. We've been talking about this forever. The long delayed political portion of the so-called dream. The the deal of the, the deal of the century. I call it the dream of the century because it's I, never going to happen. No, I call it the nightmare of the century. The nightmare of the century. But it's not going to happen. So so he he was saying because again you know it's like so the United States again trying to help the, the, the Trump administration I should say trying to help Netanyahu because they know they have nothing. They've got nothing. They've been like building. They, they did their economic conference in Bahrain. It was a fiasco, an enormous fiasco. So now they have nothing to offer. Nothing really to offer. So they don't want to release it now because they know that's just going to make them look bad and it's going to make Benjamin Netanyahu look bad. So just uh, today they announced this in a tweet, right? Uh, they didn't even have a, the courtesy to have a press conference about it. So so Jason Greenblatt, he just basically tweeted saying that, they, that they're keeping the plans details from becoming an issue in the election. Why should they become an issue? You've no. been telling us the Isra- it's going, but it's the going Israeli- to be a de- the deal of the century. Everybody should be happy, right? It's, it's the Israeli election that he's trying to protect Jamal. Let, let's keep in mind when Jason Greenblatt no, no, it, talks it, about the election, he's not no, talking about the presidential election in 2020. No, no, they were very clear. This, about the Israeli are, this election. Is, this is what they said. The move, which is, was basically, in, uh, they declared in a tweet, keeps the plans details from becoming an issue in the election in which the leadership of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a close ally of U.S. President Donald Trump, is at stake. So that's let's make that very clear why they're making this. Okay. Can I just say a few things? Good Absolutely. analysis. I, I think, you know, th- what I find this very interesting, Jamal, and our listeners should know this, that the uh, Hassan Nasrallah and the uh, Hezbollah military for four to five years now have been doing their homework uh, in, Le- in the south in Lebanon. And I believe that Benjamin Netanyahu, together with the delusions of grandeur that we have with the current president, has engage in a significant miscalculation. Although Benjamin Netanyahu thinks that he can swing the Israeli military around left and right and people will bow on their knees, Hassan Nasrallah is not the person that is going to take a knee against any military, especially the Israeli military, which he has already defeated and now has four more years of information, of reconnaissance, of weaponry, and things like that. It is a significant military force. And of course, you're right, Jamal. Iran is even 10 times that. So the Israeli military is not going to engage in a war directly with Iran. And if they were to do this in Lebanon in the south, Jamal, they would be gravely mistaken. Now, here's what I worry about. You and I know this from history. If the Israeli military cannot take out Hezbollah, who are they going to go after? They're going to go after civilians. They're going to bomb Lebanese civilians. They will bomb Palestinians in Gaza again. What they will do to hold, to, uh, uh, under the idea that it may get uh, Hassan Nasrallah to relinquish or to stop, they will start killing civilians again. They'll start bombing civilian infrastructure again, Jamal, with the idea of trying to force Hezbollah to change their tactics. Unfortunately, that's not going to work. And I'm afraid, this is my big worry right now, if the Israeli leader, Netanyahu, is really backed into a corner and he unleashes a a war like this, who's going to pay the price? It's going to be Lebanese and Palestinian civilians. It's going to be bad, of course. This is what happened in the past two major incursions Incursions, into Lebanon. And this is what you're actually, uh, Hezbollah defeated Israel not once, twice. Twice. They weren't able uh, to accomplish what they set to accomplish, um, accomplish, and that's why they left the second time very quickly because of their initial defeat uh, earlier. So, and you're right, the, the retaliation was to destroy Lebanese infrastructure, bomb Beirut, bomb apartment buildings. Imagine, they were bombing apartment buildings. With people inside. They were bombing bridges. Yeah. They were bombing uh, highways. They bombed the airport. So that's the retaliation because they were not able. If you read actually the last incursion, and this is the thing about it, 
and you will see how much force and how much power Israel put into, in two, I'm talking about 2016. Yeah, 2016. And, and how much they've, they've put into the, trying to destroy Lebanon. And then you read, because this also, this information came afterwards, you, you, you read, like, for example, what held them back is less than 3,000 Hezbollah fighters. It's unbelievable. Mostly in the south. It's unbelievable. Mostly in the south. No. We are not talking about a power with an air force or with a navy or with tanks. Nothing. Right. None of that. Right. It was basically, uh, yeah, they had the missiles that they were launching uh, into Haifa and beyond Haifa, as uh, Hassan Nasrallah says. But it's also the way they had this guerrilla warfare and the tunnels that they've had. Right. And they were able to keep them at bay with less than 3,000 fighters, elite the, fighters. I, I, and, and Netanyahu and the Israeli military know that, Jamal. And my point being... That That's why they and take... They've had, but they've had three years now to build all that up. And not only this, but also these Hezbollah fighters, they have seen war in Syria... Right. For several years. Right. So they've been, you know. Tested. Tested. Yeah. And so that's why today, and this is the joke, I go back to the mannequins that they put or the dolls or the dummies that they put in these jeeps. You know, using a tactic from, I don't know, World War II or World War I for the planes. And then, and then like I said, I saw the reporter from al Mayadeen cross the border going, say, what is this nonsense? There were no Israelis there. Well, because they were worried. They were scared. They are scared. from Because he told them that something's going to happen if you, you know. So they withdrew and left the jeeps with dolls and mannequins to see who, where the fire was going to come. Like an old tactic that actually didn't work. And, yeah, I, and I, I, worried from sniper fire, which, of right. course, Israel excels at this, but only when they are shooting at civilians in Gaza. Right. So, Jamal, I want to bring up another point that's related to this, which... I think is another reason why Benjamin Netanyahu uh, engaged in the military in this way. When Donald Trump was at the G7 and he was doing his crazy press conference, some and you know the the French president Macron met with the foreign minister of Iran, and this really irritated Trump. Somebody asked Trump if he would be willing to meet with the president of uh, Iran. And he said, I'm willing to meet with anybody and as long as there's no preconditions. If it'll help, I'm willing to meet anybody. This was the first time that he has, I mean, he said a lot of crazy things. But for, for President Trump to say that he'd be willing to meet with, uh, you know, basically the president of, uh, of Iran, not the supreme leader, but, you know, the political leadership. But then he changed his mind, by the way. Well, I'm just anyway. going to say still, putting that offer on the table made Tel Aviv... Uh, they had conniptions, to use to use a word. They were going crazy to think that Donald Trump would actually make uh, an attempt to have diplomatic relations with the Iranians right now. So there's a lot of anxiety in Tel Aviv right now. There's a lot of anxiety with Benjamin Netanyahu. There's a chance that Benjamin Netanyahu will be indicted before the next election, there's also equally a chance that Benjamin Netanyahu, because he hitched his wagon with Donald Trump, may not get reelected uh, again. Well, that, that's why the that's why the Trump administration is doing everything Absolutely. to try to get him elected, and that's why it brings me back. Absolutely. To the deal of the century, and just before I get into that, and you know what was the answer from the Iranian leader? He said, "Listen, if Donald Trump wants to have." Just a photo op. We're not interested for in a photo op. We're sending a Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> and they put a picture of both of them and said, I thought that was funny. Actually, they don't come up with a lot of jokes, but I thought that was a, 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 it's a, a good, good one. It's a, a good, good one. one. So if, if, he, if he's interested only in a photo op, we'll send him a Photoshop. Anyways, uh, the deal of the century. which The deal of the century. Which uh, they've postponed for... Uh, maybe more than a dozen times now yes. to, to, to tell the world about it's been, by the way, this is the third year now. We're getting to the fourth year in the term of the first term of hopefully the last term of Donald Trump that we haven't seen anything except this nonsense economic thing. And every time they say something. So I'm just going to read a little bit here from 
Kushner's statement because again Kushner is the guru behind this whole the architect, Middle East, yes, Middle the East uh, piece and he said uh, that they're not going to release this I'm paraphrasing because it's going to affect the Israeli elections of course they're not talking about their on elections because when they also release this, this is going to highlight another failure of the by, Trump by the Trump administration because that was also one of the cornerstones, you know, of his, you know, the wall, immigration, bringing peace to the Middle East and all these, these things. And it's going to highlight another failure because they have nothing in their bag. And then he said that, which, by the way, the deal of the century does not mention the two-state solution. No. And then Kushner explains and says, it means one thing to the Israelis, it means one thing to the Palestinians. <laughs> Explain that to me. It means it, nothing, Jamal. Yeah. So, so they asked him, well, the, show us, the, uh, doesn't talk about the two-state solution. Isn't this all based on the two-state solution? You've been telling the whole world since Oslo, since 1991, the two-state solution. It says, eh, it means nothing to the Palestinians. It means one thing to the Palestinians means another thing to the Israelis. That was his answer. Despite the notion of uh, a two-state solution being the bedrock of talks since 1991, right? So, so this was in an interview on Al Jazeera. Uh, then the other thing that they asked him about, uh, just to give them a glimpse how the political pro process will look like, he said, I think we all have to recognize that if there were ever, now if there ever is a deal, if, before it was there was a deal. Now, he, he, you know, choice of, he, the choice of his voice uh, of his words. If there ever is a deal, it's not going to be along the lines of the Arab Peace Initiative. It will be somewhere between the Arab Peace Initiative and somewhere between the Israeli position. What's the Israeli position? Well, the Israeli, the Israeli position is they take everything. They're annexing, annexing, as we're speaking, the West Bank. Area C of the best West Bank, which right. is the largest component of the West Bank, which is more than 65% of the land. Yeah, well, the, right? the Israeli peace plan, Jamal, is that they take everything and Palestinians live as slaves on their own land. So this is, this, is when then, this is when he comes back to the economy, right? So this is then he says, and then of course uh, I want to thank Jared Kushner because he speaks on behalf of all Palestinians, of all Palestinians right. in thank diaspora you. and in Palestine. Thank you, Jared. And he always says, this is how they feel. By the way, when he talks, if you, if you pay attention to his words, he said, well, if you listen to, you know, to Palestinians, what they will tell you. And of course, we know he listens to this guy from Hebron, uh, the Jabari fellow, and a couple of other people, right? And he says, if you, if you listen to Palestinians, they'll tell you that the most important thing is security, right? Then to have freer flow of goods, freer flow of people, I know that's a very big issue for the Palestinians. So the deal of century is to tell you you can pass faster maybe through a checkpoint from Ramallah to Shu'afat. And pass goods easily. And pass goods and trade, and it's about money, and it's about security, which Palestinians have none. It's not, uh, you know. So now, he's, he, he, this is what he says. He says... Thank you, Jared Kushner. Thank you, you know, exactly. This is what he says. This is how he thinks what Palestinians think and how they feel. So he's speaking on their behalf, of course, as we know that Palestinians have rejected, and I'm talking even Palestinians from the Palestinian Authority to the people they have rejected the plan long before its initial debut, just from leaks yeah. for, for all these reasons that nonsense that he, he's just kind of like not talking about. You're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM here in San Francisco. We're broadcasting live from the San Francisco studio. We're also broadcasting live on Facebook right now. You can check out that live Facebook feed at Jamal Dejani 2. We're also streaming live on the kpoo.com website. And this is Arab Talk with Justin Jamal. I, I want to kind of shift this analysis because this is really a very complex analysis, Jamal. We want our listeners to know the big picture. Let's talk about the UAE, Saudi Arabia, part in this. The Israelis, the Saudis, and the Emirates have been playing footsie now for a number of years. And not only do they have security cooperation, and not only do they have information cooperation, 
They have military cooperation now, and they are attempting to get on the same page politically, militarily, and uh, economically. And so the real story, I shouldn't say, but another aspect of this really complex story is really the Israelis wanting to make normal relations with the Saudis and the other Gulf countries. This is really what's going on. And in a very disturbing way, Jamal, we also find that the situation in Lebanon continues to deteriorate very significantly. There is one really, well, we know there's a lot of dirty players here. We know that, for example, UAE and Saudi Arabia are absolutely decimating uh, Yemen right now. It's just horrible. Although they, they have not been winning. I mean, if you look at the things with all no, the, actually just the, the military opposite. hardware that they have, with all the billions of dollars, with the, with the, with no. the support of the United States. And, They're losing. And, and they actually are not being able to make any headway aside from the killing destruction civilians. and killing civilians. And, and actually, last week, Jamal, there was, a, there was a rocket that went that came from Yemen into and near the airport in Riyadh. And this is another, this, we need a whole show to talk about Yemen because we, it is catastrophic. There. It is catastrophic. But I, I really want to point out that the UAE has been playing a really dirty game across the board uh, in this, in their real close collaboration with the Israelis. There goes your visa to the UAE, James. <laughs> <I know. laughs> There was an article that came out in The Guardian. Well, we have to say the truth. No, you have this to. is Arab talk. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to, but and we will criticize anyone. Anyone who deserves it. Exactly. And unfortunately, MBZ, who is the leader of UAE, um, has struck a sweetheart deal with the United States. Jamal, I have a question for you. What is the only country in the world where the CIA does not spy on it? The UAE. The UAE. There's some really crazy things going on in terms of, I mean, the United States even spies on the Israelis. I mean, the Israelis spy on Americans all the time. We know that. It's reciprocal spying. It's part of spycraft. But there was this uh, article that got uh, published in The Guardian. I'm pretty sure it was The Guardian. One of the British newspapers that spoke to uh, a couple of sources within the CIA who talked about this sweetheart deal that is going on in UAE right now where the CIA has a, is because of the quid pro quo, in other words, the dirty work that the UAE is doing right now, either on behalf of the Israelis or the Americans, that the CIA has decided not to spy on the UAE right now. What a colossal security breach for the world and for the United States because this is part of the global security apparatus that and they're also they're also in, in involved in in those uh, interrogation the black sites black sites yeah, absolutely this is they've been doing this for the CIA where in Yemen no they're they're the ones doing the torture it, program it, it happens in Yemen it we, happens in the UAE and i want to add something because there's also some some added to this whole concoction another mis mystery a mysterious Israeli businessman, you, you heard about this story. Yeah. So people can look at it up, you know, who is behind a mega deal to supply spy planes to the UAE, because you're talking about the United States and the Israeli connection. So just this week, Jess, two business jets, jets an offshore uh, company, millions in cash, wealthy Gulf Royals, one Israeli businessman, the mysterious Israeli, you know, they, there was a leaked document revealing the secrets behind the UAE's newest spy planes, which is Israel, so, which are from the Israelis. So, for so the UAE is really now involved in the in the intelligence gathering. When you talked about the CIA, who are they gathering it for? I mean, such a small country. How many enemies they have? How many wars are they involved in? No, I they think are. This is a whole regional. You know what it, what, it, what it reminds me of, and people probably most our listeners don't know, what's one of the favorite uh, vacation spots where people, Costa Rica, right? People don't know that Costa Rica, it's a beautiful country, by the way, for vacations. I haven't been there. Have you been there? Yeah. No, I haven't been, but I hear it's beautiful. It is. But that's, an, that's a well-known CIA hub. Of course it is. This is the well-known CIA hub 
for South America and Central America. Costa Rica for years it just swarming with CIA agents that they get dispatched. Another spot is Morocco, which I'm not going to even go there because out, outside Tangier, there is also a major CIA listening and now center you, for, and, and the UAE. for Northern Africa right. and, and Africa. So now for the Gulf, the UAE, we're finding more and more about it, and it's all connected between the United States intelligence agencies, which would be, which would be the CIA, the Israeli Mossad, they're getting new equipment, they're getting spy planes, there is an Israeli, there is a sur surveillance planes that recently began, they began basically just trial flights. Uh, basically this marks the last stages of a secret mega deal that began about a decade ago. It's all coming out. I'm not making, it sounds like no, I'm making up I, stuff. I, but Jamal, I'm not making this up either. What I'm and trying- That has a major connection to Israel. What I'm trying to say is that the UAE is diversifying their portfolio to become the center of surveillance, uh, secret surveillance, secret prisons. They're, they're basically the new uh, uh, cyber security and uh, prison system uh, proxy for Israel in the United States. And by the way, these planes have been supplied by the Israeli businessman and entrepreneur, uh, Mantia. What's his name? Koshavi. Mantia Shokavi. Koshavi, or, or the, he's referred to as Mati. Well, so, so, so he knows MBZ so, really well. So he's been, you know, there are documents uh, originating basically in papers that were leaked by the International Consortium Investigative Journalists, ICIJ. People can look, uh, look this up. And the German newspaper Zeitung in 2017 revealed that the deal involved total payments of about 3 billion Israeli shekels equivalent to about $846 million, you know. Uh, the documents note that at least part of the sum was paid for in cash. Cash money. Cash money. And they name UAE leaders as being connected to one of the companies involved in the transaction. So that's this. why this is important, Jamal, just to bring it all back together. There is a concerted effort to destabilize Iran, to undermine Iran economically, politically, and, and to destabilize them as much as possible so that the Israeli-American Gulf axis of economic, political, and cyber power is maintained. That, that's really the big picture here. That's why we see the Israelis doing the bidding that's why we see the Israel Israelis wanting the Americans to get involved in trying to destabilize Iran, to get involved militarily. And we could really be seeing Jamal. I mean, there's the real possibility if Donald Trump or Benjamin Netanyahu miscalculates, and both of them are deeply unstable people, both facing deep anxiety with um, upcoming elections, with one small miscalculation, could turn the region into a, a sea of fire, destruction, where, in, where, where thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of in, innocent civilians could be at risk. I mean, to see what they did in Lebanon, Syria, in Iraq in one week, Jamal, and to know what Hassan Nasrallah can do and he doesn't bluff, I really believe this is one, and having someone as unstable as Donald Trump, I really believe that this is one of the most dangerous times in the Arab world right now than we've seen in many, many years. So my question to you, since you monitor the Arab media, is my concern about how close we are to uh, some sort of mil military you know, uh, conflagration, is this being echoed in the Arab press right now? Well, it's definitely there is a concern. I mean, I mean- Are they as concerned at, at as least, I am? Uh, well, I don't know if they're as concerned as you are because they're so used to so many incursions and attacks and preemptive, so-called preemptive strikes by Israel attacking Gaza, attacking Lebanon, attacking Syria. So it's not surprising. Now, is it going to escalate to a full-fledged war. Do they think that? 
I think so. I think people are very nervous okay. because, as we've said, you know, just, you know, this is, and, and, and people who understand the region very well, and if you understand the region very well and the politics behind it, it's all about timing. And historically, this is what Benjamin Netanyahu... He does. He, he did this every single time that he, he felt that he was in trouble with his constituency or it was a close election because it was. Otherwise, he would have been... He's now... It's basically a redo of the elections because he wasn't able to form his coalition. Exactly. So he's like sitting on the edge and then there are others who are trying to replace him. So he has to prove to the Israeli public that he's their savior. Right. Just like Donald Trump, he's the king of Israel. Well, actually, this is a title now he's competing with Benjamin Netanyahu because, <laughs> you know, someone anointed him as the king of, uh, of the Jews and Israel. But Benjamin Netanyahu liked to be... In, in fact, in fact, his supporter, they, supporters, they like to compare him to King David and sing for him and wherever. And he feels very threatened. He is, he is sitting precariously in that prime minister's office and he will find anything to strive, you know. But I think, again, he's going to be picking at the wrong no, he picked the wrong person. The wrong person to mess with, with this Hassan Nasrallah. Right. And he knows it. So uh, is it a ploy, for example, sending the drones and making a threat and saying we're going to go after Iranian targets? Well, let me tell you something. If Benjamin Netanyahu knew that he's going to go after Iran, Iran, let's say, not just in Syria, I'm talking about deep into Iran, just like he goes and tests the water in Iraq, in Lebanon, Syria, he would have done that a long time ago. And that's why for many years, he was coming at the United Nations, to the White House, to Congress, egging the U.S. administration, starting from, you know, and before Obama, to do his dirty work. Because he knows without American support... He can't do it. Well, he might be able to do the first strike, but then how is he, how is he going to handle the retaliation. Well, that's where the UAE and Saudi Arabia come in. And, well. Yeah, and, and that's why I that's think where they come he, in. he has been testing the water by sending drones into Iraq, sending right. drones into Lebanon, sending drones into Syria. Until yesterday or the day before yesterday when Hassan Nasrallah said, listen, you're gonna, if you're going to do this again, we're going to retaliate. And that's why they have the panic. So, so maybe it was a bluff. Maybe it's not, but we know these things, how they start. One misstep, That's one mistake can just set the whole region on fire. So, Jamal, let me, uh, we're going to switch gears here in a minute because we only have a little bit of time left. But let me ask you, I'm going to make a comment with a question and then we're going to change the gears. So, every country has a right to defend its sovereign right and to act in its best interests. Iran is no different from any, any other sovereign country. They have a right to defend themselves. They have a right to act in their strategic interests, whatever. But how is it that when Kim Jong-un does all these missile firings, you know, and test missiles, and now yesterday they reveal that the North Koreans have a, a submarine that they're building that can launch these missiles, potentially nuclear missiles, from a submarine that Trump goes... I trust Kim Jong-un. So in terms of world destabilization, you have Trump making footsie with Kim Jong-un, alienating the Chinese, wanting to bring Putin back to the G7. It's a psychotic kind of foreign policy, Jamal. And that's why I think this time for the region in the Arab world, it's particularly unstable because we have no leadership coming from the United States to keep everybody in check. Next big story, speaking of Donald Trump and, so, you know, well, you went to an Ivy League school, but when we think of the top Ivy League school or one of the top universities in the world. Uh, don't get me started now. When you talk about one of the I know best. Where you, I know where you are heading. When you to. talk about one of the best universities, not just in the United States, but in the world, you talk about Harvard. Getting into Harvard University is a big deal, full stop. Yeah. So we had breaking news again this week. We had this young man 
who was accepted to Harvard. The Palestinian living in in the West Bank. No, living in, in Lebanon. Oh, uh, living in, in Lebanon. Lebanon. That's right, near one of the camps. Got admitted to, to Harvard. Harvard. You know how difficult is this? Well, listen, it gets, it gets. And by the way, he doesn't have his father or mother are no a Hollywood actor. No, or, no, no. It gets even better. The, you know, the, the parents <laughs> didn't pay for him to get in. They don't yeah. have money. So you have this Palestinian living in Lebanon on his own getting accepted to Harvard. Here's the best part, Jamal. He has a visa to come to the United States. Yeah. He gets a visa. He's a protege. He's a protege. He comes in. He is going through customs the week before he's supposed to start at Harvard, and he's denied entry, even though he has a valid visa. Here's the best part, Jamal. He, and you've, you and I have gone through this. He's asked for his telephone and his computer. He gives it up. They take his computer for X number of hours. They come back and they basically say to him, you're, you, whatever you're doing on your social media, you're an enemy. It's basically you're consorting with people who want to destroy the United States it's and Israel. Based, and it's based on postings by his friends, not, not him. him. That's my point. That's the thing. On It's like so people look, right. are it's criticizing the... U.S. government, people criticize the U.S. government all the time. Right. So he's denied entry, Jamal. Yeah. And again, even though I'm going to make this statement because, you know, here there goes the First Amendment. What First Amendment? And this is where we preach to the world about freedom of speech, uh, you know, and, and your civil rights, even though some will argue that he wasn't a U.S. citizen, but that's actually not true. The Constitution applies to everyone. Who steps on the by soil. By the way. Yeah. Except there is an exception that when you are at the borders with custom agents, they throw your First Amendment in the trash bin, sadly. And they can do anything they want, or at least, and especially now under the Trump administration. So his privacy is invaded. I mean, this is a young kid. He's not a terrorist. Uh, people have all kinds of opinions. You should read the media in, forget about the U.S. media, like uh, just watch, you know, the debates every single day about criticism to this administration in the United States, but go read the media or watch the news at uh, our allies, so-called allies, the French, the Brits, the Canadians, wherever. They're making a mockery out of right. the administration and here. And, and, the, and the U.S. government. So this guy said, oh, they have found some posts that are but critical. Post, posts from other people. So, Jamal, I have a question for you. The idea of coming into the, a country and having to give up your phone and your computer, what country, what other country does that remind you of? Well, let me guess. That's a hard guess. <laughs> How many times have we gone to visit Palestine, Jamal, and we are forced when we get to the Israeli customs or Israeli checkpoint to give up our cell phones well, this is and not, to give up our computers. Yeah, but this is not the joke. I mean, we're making a joke out of it, but... It's no joke. If you go back, and this is not just the customs, but we know, and this is a fact, that many or several uh, um, security agencies in this country have been trained... By, by the Israelis. By the Israelis. Yeah, yeah. So these methods, as far as airport searches, etc., they have Israeli advisors. And so so this profiling that started uh, since 9-11 and, and, and goes beyond this, and the whole idea of the Muslim ban and what have you, but going into uh, people's... Uh, Phone book and, and telephones and but notes. This, and but my, I have a couple of. That's a that's a that's a methodology that Israel uses. They use they use it all the time. And l l let's just let's just be very clear about this. This kid is brilliant. His parents did not buy off Harvard. He he didn't do the Kushner way of getting into Harvard. No. He got in on his own merits. He had a valid visa. He came here, and because of posts, I mean, it's an embarrassment, people. really. I mean, this, this, like, you know, we talk about Harvard. There are many other great universities, but he was vetted. Let's put it this way: he was vetted as a great prospect for Harvard University. So why isn't Harvard? And then he's he's good enough to 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 be admitted to Harvard, but he's not good enough to enter the United States. End of story. End I mean, of story. I mean, this is how it went, and it's an embarrassment, really. 
that but and I heard at least I, I have been reading that they're trying very hard that the university now is interceding what is, what is, on his behalf. But what is Harvard doing? I, I've read that they have been interceding, trying to contact, I guess, uh, the Custom Border Patro- uh, c- Control, uh, ICE, whatever, any agencies that are in charge of uh, preventing him from coming here to look into it further, because he doesn't pose any threat to this country. Well, and and just based on something that not, even though it's a violation, had he criticized the United States, it's based on people, you know, that posted on his timeline? But is it a violation to criticize the United States, Jamal? Come on. Well, if you're in an authoritarian regime, it (laughs) is, and it seems that we are, that uh, this is the, and also this sets an example. So this is another thing, and then this is this is yet another example, and I think it's an embarrassing example to do it. But also, it's not a coincidence. When you have the President of the United States conspiring against two members of Congress, the only and no. the first two Muslim women. Four, four women of Congress. Uh, yeah, but those are, I'm talking about. Two, two Muslim women. Two yeah. Muslim women in Congress, and on behalf of the Israeli government, egging the Israeli government not to admit them, not to admit them to a country that has received from the U.S. taxpayers. Billions of dollars. Over $150 billion to, this, to date. And they are, I mean, Congress basically is the body that appropriates foreign aid money to Israel. To Israel. So I I want to end on a a ridiculous note since we're talking about Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. So some GOP, some Republicans in Alabama, I think it's Alabama or Mississippi, something like that, are putting a petition, Jamal, Jamal, to have... Ilhan Omar um, removed from <laughs> removed from Congress. So you have people in another state trying to remove a congresswoman who was duly elected by her own constituency in another state. Now we we can joke about this, I know, but the reality is is that the ugliness of the hate, the vilification. And the this um, vile kind of attitude towards Arabs, towards Muslims, towards African Muslims, toward women of color in Congress is getting to the point now where, you know, these congresswomen, Jamal, have to have special security. They have to have special details. They are getting threats all the time. And... When this thing came up from this, these GOP uh, representatives, uh, Republican representatives in, in another state, you didn't hear Donald Trump condemning that. Of course it's not. Listen, this is really the, the uh, what can I say? Well, I know what I can say, but I won't say it. <laughs> okay, well. Because <laughs> we, we're, we're actually coming to another close, but we're, we have to. Well, well, let me just say something quickly. I mean, when you have now a president in the White House who has been attacking Muslims, who has been attacking immigrants, when he, who, who, who has been embracing white supremacists, and then look at this kind of crazy thing. You have one challenger so far uh, that who challenged him from within the Republican Party. Well, three and, now. And, uh, well, and, and this challenger, who's the other two? Because well, there's two more. There's... Two more. There's a governor, and then there's another congressman. Okay. But you're talking about Walsh, yeah. who's also an Islamophobe. Who, who basically is a birther. He was calling, he was going after Obama. Obama, and he just apologized for it yesterday. But he's still an Islamophobe. Yeah, and he said, well, he was sorry. He didn't say he was sorry that Obama is a U.S. citizen, because that's the whole birther that he wasn't born in this country. He said, I was sorry, I'm sorry that I called him a Muslim. <laughs> So what, that's, 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 this is what he was apologizing for. You can understand the whole mentality behind the Republican Party well, well, and the ugly yeah, yeah. state of mind that they have. Well, on that, uh, on that note, we want to thank you for joining us today on Arab Talk. You've been listening to Justin Jamal at KPOO in San Francisco, 89.5 FM. Check our website for all of our podcasts. That's ArabTalkRadio.com. And if you want to watch us live on Facebook, go to Jamal's uh, Facebook uh, live page, which is Jamal Dejani 2. We'll see you next week.